what? We're library live. Hey, guess what? It's just the Scott Kid. We're at Palace Day, Sheila Reno. It is Thursday night. And all the way from San Bernardino, California. Hey, Funk. Hello. I just. Thanks for joining us for our last Thursday in 2019. Ooh. It was a wonderful way to end the year. Thank you very much. Uh, let's talk about how you come to be in our basement from California. Let's see. Where I, where I first heard, learned about your show, but you know, um, I know I'm, I'm in with like all the podcasts and Scott radio shows. You know, um, friends with TZ Phillips, who runs does the Scott Parade in like California. I know, um, I know Maddie, who does uh, Talk to Scott. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so just I guess probably from there to guest pages, found found you and it's like, oh, you're in Kenosha. Um, you know, I. Uh, Played the show last year with uh, Two Ball Screwball from Kenosha, and so I have friends here out here um, from Song Welfare. Also um, played with them for, out in Southern California. So um, figured I book a show for this year as soon as you saw you posted dates. And and timing worked out perfect because you're really here for work, right? Technically speaking, yes. Mm -hmm. I uh, I'm in town. I'm in Chicago for uh, the Midwest Clinic Band Orchestra Conference. How do you come to be in the Midwest when you're out in California for this this clinic? Okay, so this this conference is the world's biggest band orchestra conference. So it's internationally it's an international thing. We get international groups um, you know, from like Japan, China. Um, we get a lot of um, representative like Japanese band directors and Chinese band directors coming out, um, and it's super educational, um, super super big opportunities to network in my field, my profession. So how long have you been Nate Funk as this? Okay, so Nate Funk, okay. Um, I have to back up before that. So um, in 2011, I joined um, this Scott Funk band with, um, called the Two-Tone Loners. Um, I played keyboards for them. So I, I was basically the guy no one gave a shit about and a band no one gave a fuck about. Um, but, um, you know, we grew up in kind of rose in the LA Scott scene. Um, like my s second show with them, um, we played the LA Star Wars Festival. It was this huge deal. I was like, what the fuck is this? I was tripping out because it was like this huge wall of kids like fucking watching our band. It was like probably like probably like a thousand to fifteen hundred kids like watching our band at this festival and mm -hmm. like fuck this is amazing. Um, so I did that band for a while um, and then it kind of we had our growing pains as a band, um, and then we kind of had this curse sometimes where um, whenever we did backyard shows, the cops would shut it down before we got to play, <laughs> and um, sometimes for shows that were at venues, like, they would have to drop off because, oh, I got scheduled to work that day, like, then we just work in the city or something like that. So whenever the latter happened, you know, like, um, we had to drop off from a show, that's where I was stepping in, I played, like, a solo set, um, basically just, like, covers and, like, um, acoustic versions of Future Butter songs. Like I wasn't the main vocalist. Um, Robert was the, the main vocalist, and like doing main, mainly all the writing. Um, I did some writing. There's one Tito Butter song that ended up being recorded that I wrote. Um, it's Gang with Me. Um, Troubles Come and Go. Um, but um, I started exploring my old songwriting um, as that was happening. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, our first like niche funk. This band show was um, supposed to be a two tone runner show. Um, this was for the Scott Punk Festival or some bowling alley. Um, That's cool. I feel like Max was there. I think Holophonics played it. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I'm entirely sure. Um, no, no, it wasn't Holophonics. It was a uh, barrier event. It was, um, I want Scandalism um, back when they were around. And uh, Maxie's played as well, um, who I play for now. Um, but it was just us doing three pieces set. We did covers. We did. We covered. We did a, a punk rock version of uh, of uh, Jesus is a friend of mine. My son's name. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is a friend. You know, there's a Christmas version. Santa is my friend. I just found that out. I just found that out yesterday. Oh my gosh! Yeah. We'll have to look that up. So, yeah, it's long winded. So um, the one, when like that iteration of Funk happened, where it was just like filling in for Tito Boners, that happened from like basically like. 2013 to like 
um, till like my the semester when I student taught in 2015, and then like I was like, okay, that's it. And then um, after I finished student teaching, when I got my first um, teaching job, um, that's when I started kind of like it was kind of like a side sort of thing, like. Um, Tito Motors got asked to do a show, and it was another case of Tito Motors dropping off a show. Um, um, we did a sh some shows with um, Still Alive, uh, they're from Chicago, um, great band. Um, they had a run of dates, and I get this call from um, my friend Brent Friedman. He's drum for uh, We're the Union now. Um, does booking, and you know he's well connected guy. He's like, Nate. Okay, so the show was um, Still Alive and Tito Motors. You know. Um, I gotta talk to you about something, you know, because I used to work at the venue. Um, Leftover Crack it, um, it released a, um, just releasing a new album, and they're looking for a less than 200 um, cap venue, um, performance space venue to shoot a music video at, and Rich Town DIY would be perfect. Um, but here's the catch, like, everyone else would have to drop from that show, uh, um, other than Still Alive. Mm. Um, but, I could throw um, I could throw you um, onto another show with Still Alive, mm -hmm. so that happened. So um, by then I had written some more songs, um, and so um, that show um, when I played with Still Alive in this little tiny record store in um, Santa Ana was the first iteration of like new new funk with like new songs, you know, more pop punk oriented than like ska. Like, I still like I still love ska. I still write ska a lot of ska. Um, and then, let's see, what really, really spurred um, the, the project as it is right now was um, <laughs> I did the most punk rock thing ever. Um, my school, um, so the school I, where I taught at, um, we gave most of our percussion equipment um, away to our district drum line because they were starting district drum line. Mm -hmm. So the district came in and um, bought us some new equipment. And so this new equipment included like a couple of mics. And so um, we got the school. The school got mics, and I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna teach myself how to uh, like really, really record and really, really mix." And um, so, and I had these songs written. So um, I bought a, a, an interface for myself, um, which was out of my pocket. But I used school equipment, school mics. I used uh, <laughs> the drum set that I donated to the school. I used a school bass amp to, to record. Um, and I used my classroom to record, like all my everything that you hear on all my recordings. Um, the last I releases was class. recorded in my classroom, <laughs> um, and so that's how the current iteration is. Um, it's hundred percent DIY. Like the experiment was like, okay, this I it's this project where it's like, okay, I'm doing all the songwriting, I'm doing all the performing, I'm doing all the recording, I'm doing all the mixing, doing all the mastering, all that good stuff, um, and like I'm was after growing up was done that full length, like. Um, it wasn't the greatest, like I'm gonna admit, like I've gotten a lot better at mixing since then, but um, it's given me the skills and given me the confidence to like put out even, even more music, which was led up to the EP I put out in March. So then when you were performing tonight, all of the stuff that we heard, you did. Yes, most of it. Um, some of them I like, I had just programmed, pre-programmed drums, so like, um, I programmed drums as scratch tracks and then recorded drums with that in, um, in the actual recordings, but then um, for some of the live stuff that I do live um, and solo, I just left the old like computer drums on it. Hmm. So then, how many instruments do you play? <sighs> <sighs> Too many. That's a hard sigh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so my main instrument is piano. I have a degree in classical piano performance. Wow. Um, Shout out to Ali Colotta from Stop the Presses for like the two people in the Scott scene with classical <laughs> piano performance degrees. Mm -hmm. um, but in band, I played uh, trombone in euphonium, so um, I was a brass guy. Um, learned to play woodwinds in college, so um, that's how I learned to play sax. Um, I played. I was in drumline in high school, so that's how I learned how to play drums. <laughs> Okay, and you play guitar. Taught myself to play guitar in seventh grade. You know, my my cousin started teaching himself. Like, fuck, I'll I'll, I'll learn too. Okay, <laughs> yeah. and since then, I mean, you have been on tour. It seems like forever. So, how do you balance professional life teaching with going on these kind of extended runs? So, I treat touring as vacation, basically. 
Um, <laughs> you guys got a substitute. Fuck <laughs> y'all. Yeah. I'm busy. Um, <laughs> I, I got us up for this week because of the conference. Um, <laughs> not this show. Yeah, this finals, this finals week, <laughs> not the show. Um, so uh, the fact that I was doing the solo for the longest time um, gave me the flexibility to like, you know, like, okay, um, I don't necessarily have to book shows every solid. Like, I could probably find an open mic in this town or fucking find a place to play in like a cafe sure. or something um, if there's a, a date I need to fill. Um, and then I could just schedule around my, my, my teaching schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, like, okay. Uh, spring break. I'm gonna fucking just do a run. I'm gonna go up to, to Portland back. Okay, uh, summer, you know, okay, have this much time be before band camp. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just do yada yada in two weeks. Mm. So on and so forth. Um, things are gonna be changing for 2020 because um, this year I finally got like a steady band together. Mm. Like really good friends uh, with them and like they're, they're solid musicians. Um, but yeah, uh, we're looking to record in March. We're probably gonna do some Bay Area dates then, but we're hoping to do like a two week tour as a three piece um, will, will in the you, summer. Will you will you come back here? I'm talking. I'm in, so thinking about it. Actually, you should do it. You yes. should do it. Yes. So besides this, talk about that. You have another full band. Mm -hmm. How well um, do you balance this as your primary mm -hmm. and another band? And, and what does that look like as far as recording your own stuff versus recording with a group? Okay, so um, I, play, I play keyboards for uh, this pop punk band called The Maxis. Um, we're from Greenland. We're a Riverside band I'm from California. Um, <laughs> Why the air quotes? <laughs> from Greenland, yeah. <laughs> it's, we're a fun band. Um, but, um, you know, that, that band, like... I barely had to do anything like the um, they put out a full length like two three years ago. Um, I recorded scratch organs for that. They had an, another keyboard player for that. Um, but um, for live shows, the live shows are like mo usually months between those shows that we book, uh, and like the, the songs are so simple enough. It's like okay, we could wing it for gigs, or if it's a big show, we're just like okay, just one rehearsal, we'll, we'll do it. Um, and Maxis did do like a few national tours with like Real Big Fish. Like mm -hmm. we actually just played with Real Big Fish at, in Anaheim like a month or two ago. Um, House of Blues, right? House of Blues, uh -huh. amazing show. We direct supported, um, but um, you know, it, fortunately, it doesn't have large time commitment. Um, I don't know what the plans are. I because I know we just put out a two song EP, and. Um, I'm not sure what our singers' plans are for recording, for touring, um, mm -hmm. for two, 2020. Uh, but the guys in, in that band are in other bands too. Like the drummer plays for Suburban Legends. Mm -hmm. um, the drummer and his brother the is the, <laughs> his brother is the guitarist for um, uh, uh, who's a guitarist also plays in um, another band with him um, uh, called the B Sharps. So like they they've got book schedules. Um, so, you know, everyone's in other bands. <laughs> so it's like basically like a super group, but um, that's like the only other project that I have balance with, and like the time commitment is not that 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 big. So this is easy for you. It's easy. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably the first one to to come on and be so um, calm and go with I, the flow. I just have to. I just have to say that after being in a ska band with like we had nine people at one point and going to, from that and like. Oh, Nate Funk is a three piece when we we play full band. It's like it is so great to not have to deal with nine fucking people. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to record, I'm sure, and coordinate yeah. schedules and and do that sort of thing. In order to, to record two tone boners, uh, we we did, we did our EP. Like we ended up having to fucking like okay, all right, we're gonna meet at the studio at midnight, and we're gonna we have a block of time. We can stay as as late as we need to, and then it was like okay, we did this few like two three sessions. We're like. Started at midnight and we got out at like five in the morning. And then you had to go to school. Like go to school or something. Go to work. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, as far as teaching goes, we've had a few other teachers on. Um, how, you know, free. How, how easy is it to separate personal with professional, or or does it bleed over? And do you just want to shake these kids and go, you can do this too? <laughs> I mean, that, um, at the end of the day, I. I I feel I want to be kind of I want to inspire the, the the kids I teach you know the music students I teach to that and empower them um, with the thought that they could make this music on your own like 
I didn't I didn't have any lessons playing guitar. I had to fucking teach myself how to play guitar in, in, when I was in seventh grade, you know? Um, and, like, the thing about art, the thing about music is that I feel um, people are too fucking scared to do shit that they want because they're worried more about being good than putting something out there. Mm. And it's more important to put something out there than putting out something good in, in most situations. Huh. So how do you push past that or how would you encourage somebody to push past it and say just do it just just record something get it out there and then see what happens so the the biggest thing um you know it's i'm still building the culture like even those this year five into it i'm you know i'm constantly reevaluating what i do but like i'm working really hard to establish a culture where it's like okay it's okay to fail like you know people have to realize that you you do, you do a music class you do band class um there's an expectation that you're not gonna you're not gonna know what you're supposed to be doing when you when you walk in, and that's okay. You know, it's okay to fail. Um, that then that's how you improve. It's just failure. Boom. Like, oh my boom. gosh. <laughs> yes, and that's such an important thing. I feel like that has kind of become lax, not only with music and art, um, but in general society. Mm -hmm. We're very afraid to fail. Thank you, eighties. Fuck you all. Um, but, but that is a thing. Kids are afraid to even try yeah. because they're afraid of failing and you don't know what you don't know and you can't fail if you don't ever fucking try. Yep. It's a learning experience. Like, so thank you for reiterating I, I just, that. I, and, you know, I, 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 I've taken some time to reflect. Like um, Throughout this past year, this past school year so far, and like really on this trip, like I've been just thinking like the kids that I teach learn in a very different way from even when I when I went to school and I'm literally like half a generation removed like not even a whole generation um, <laughs> like 10 years maybe. yeah and um, <laughs> they learn differently um, the culture is different and the, it's the parental culture is different um, I'm not sure how it is out, out here but it, um, I know in Southern California like parents I feel kind of shelter their kids from from that failure and so it creates that and um, it's it's a systemic thing, you know, with that, We're especially with the 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 push towards um, just technology, um, science, technology, engineering, math, education. Um, but like by adding arts, you have to have that as a human element, and part of the human element is it's okay to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing, whether you're playing solo or with a group or anything. There will be times where you fail. Like there are people who get up on stage and they've been doing this the longest and they still like that was the worst show I've ever done and mm -hmm. you know what it's I think confidence and it's a learning experience you have to have those moments so that you can continue to grow because you might go back and rewrite that riff mm -hmm. or say nope this this baseline needs to go here and you're not going to know that if you don't go try to do those things and yes I think you are right um we are weird parents because we encourage the failure, mm. um, whereas I think with our kids in school, um, it, it's almost um, entitlement. And when we say entitlement, because that word is thrown around so much, it, it's, it's more than just being given things, it's also um, being coddled. And that doesn't do anything if you want to continue to have a culture of mm -hmm. music and stuff. Um, and you can hear that on the radio. You have these people who play, if it's rock or if it's pop or if it's whatever, it's being mass pr produced mm -hmm. and regenerated through different apps. Yeah. And that's not true music. True music is sitting down and saying, okay, you play this, you play this, and you play this, and we're all gonna figure out how these parts go together. And that inspires not only creation and learning, but math, and can be applied then to all of those other mm -hmm. STEM uh, classes that I feel is currently the push. So, thank you, because there's a lot of people who are like, you let your kids fuck up? Yeah, you have to fuck up. I fuck up. You know, I'm not perfect. In fact, and... I, I find that some, like, like looking at my colleagues who are teachers, like, some of the best teachers I know were, like, not really good kids. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was, so, this is an aside, but it's funny having you now as a teacher sit in our house tonight. On the way to school this morning, mm -hmm. the middle child, who is probably one of our most difficult, is afraid to try because he is yes, afraid to fail. He is. Um, he, we're driving to school and he's like, you know, 
and this is something he's never said. Every t- like all the other kids have a plan. They want to be this when they grow up. He's like, I'm gonna live with you forever. No, you're not. Yes, I am. On the way to school today, he goes, you know, I think maybe I'll be a teacher. I think that would be cool. And I was like, oh, that's really neat to hear you say why. He's like, because it seems fun. Because you can teach people how to do stuff. I'm like, what would you want to teach? He's like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, what age group? And so that stemmed a whole conversation. But that's important. I think having people reach a certain maturity where it's okay to um, expand thought. So. Thank you, teacher. Yes. Teacher Nate in the house tonight. Good. We're not the only weirdos. Yeah. Um, and I remember the first 10 years I didn't go to college. <laughs> so so with that being said, do you, do you watch any of your students form any 10. bands? Do you guys have like a battle of the bands? And, and you know, how else do you kind of fuel your kids into being things? Okay, so... Um, I've had some unique experiences. So, um, my student teaching experience, I taught, I actually taught at um, Huntington Beach High School, um, which is, has an interesting um, setup. So they actually have two music programs on their campus. They have what's called their um, their um, MMET program, the Music Multi Media Entertainment and Technology program, which is basically it's a guitar class during your day and then after school for their um, academy, they do pop music and rock music. Um, so I worked with some of those kids. I also student taught with uh, their band director. They had a traditional music program, their orchestral program, mm. band orchestra, you know, chamber music, jazz, all the good stuff. Um, one of my students from the band side of things um, actually um, started um, a band called Scottery Jam. Now he just actually just started. We heard of those guys. Yes, <laughs> those were all my my students from student teaching. Um, and Dude. they start. They he started. He just recently started a new band called the Readjusters. Oh, cool! They just had a record release. Um, he plays trombone for Half Past Two now. Yeah. Which, which is weird because I played. I played keyboards for Half Past Two. <laughs> I was well, gonna say they show. interviewed with us, yes. and that got brought up. Yeah. Um, Look at you influencing me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so that that there's that. Um, and from that program, they have like a lot of. And then from the other side of things, from the pop music program, they have a lot of powerhouse. Like they have a current student there right now. Who's like a, a country star, basically? Mm. Apparently, um, one of our former students um, started his own record studio. Um, one of their former students, um, one of my friends, um, and he wor- works with their program as like um, to help out like with instruction and stuff like that because he's into media stuff like that. Um, he has this band called Junior Root. They're like this. Um, how to describe it, but they're they're an indie band basically. Hmm. Um, but they they they've uh, toured nationally. They've gotten a lot of attention. They kind of blew up a little bit in in their their, their genre. Um, so there there's that, and you know it's it's kind of inspiring. Um, I really can share those those stories with my kids too. But um, with my school that I currently teach at, I teach at San Bernardino. Um, we it's a working class co- uh, community. There's a lot of people of color um, that I, that I teach a lot of. Um, Predominantly Hispanic and African American, um, but uh, you know, there's we have this um, this community program called Teen Music Workshop. They do like um, you know like pop music from like seventies, eighties, um, some from like today. Um, you know, they get teach kids uh, like the the rock instruments. They teach them um, how to sing. They teach them how to move on stage and all that good stuff. Um, Kind of like how the way my the program was set up at Huntington Beach High, um, high School mm-hmm. when I was teaching, but um, as an after school like community program, not a school program, a community program. Mm-hmm. Um, some of my students participated in that, um, and so they got to, to have their rock experience from there. But it was like you know like okay let's start like a kind of something like Chicago sort of thing um, last year. Um, this year I have a sophomore kid though. Um, he. Sometimes plays drums for that program, I believe. He's a very sax player. Mm. Um, but he's working on try- hard to try to start a ska band right now. Neat. Yeah, so I was like, yeah, that's so cool. Um, actually, when I got my copies of the Pick It Up Ska documentary yeah. DVD, I actually gave it to him. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. That's neat to know that there are still young human beings that are interested in, you know, a specific genre of music that started in the 50s. You know, and for a while it did die out, and then, you know, it's kind of seen a resurgence. I do have to say, as far as resurgence goes, are you playing with a lot of ska bands and staying in this niche community? Or when you go out and play, are you playing with a broader uh, variety of genres? So, like, nowadays, you know, like, 
uh, most teaching takes up most of my time. Like you know, like it gets crazy. Like sometimes I'll work like up to like eighty plus hour work weeks, um, especially in the fall season uh, with marching band. Um, but uh, you know, most of the time, you know, all, the bands I play with, like all I all I'm mainly managing is just playing with Nate Funk, the Maxis, and uh, and uh, sometimes I'll play with uh, Odd Robot, but. Um, I don't get to play much ska anymore, and I, I, it kind of makes me a little bit sad because you know I love the music <laughs> so much. You know, if I can put me on horns, put me on keyboard, put me on <laughs> something. I guess what you're yeah. saying is that you need to start your own. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Taking auditions now. <laughs> so, um, speaking of you know booking and coordinating and doing your own thing, um, when you set up these tours. Are you reaching out to venues first, or are you connecting with bands and saying, hey, I want to come out your way, please set this up and I'll play, or or what does booking a tour for you look like? It, it's a mixture, you know, um, I've worked with enough bands um, from, you know, from Tito Boners, from um, from being a booker promoter at this uh, this DIY space in La Plenty, California, named uh, Bridgetown DIY. I, I was there when the space opened and worked with them for like about two, three years with booking acts and Helping run sound and, and volunteering, to try to help to help this the space grow. Um, so that's that's where, where I built a lot of my connections is, is from the band and from that space. And so um, from there, I also learned about like okay, these are cool spaces to play in these other cities. And I even learned like oh yeah, like this place their their the owners are kind of racist, so like yeah, don't play there. Or, like, yeah. <laughs> Their their bouncer was a rapist at this bar. <laughs> oh yeah, that's scary. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you know where not to play. Yeah, that I think that that's just as important as knowing where to play as knowing where not to play. Gotcha. Um, um what is that so um, being a solo, a solo performer, you know, doing a solo it gave me a lot of flexibility to to, to do both ways because like you know I'd be able to fill a date if I wasn't able to fill a date with a band or with a full lineup or even with like a venue that has sound, like I could just pull out a piece of guitar, or, like you know, like the mini app, and just like, hey, you know, get me a little coffee shop, and I'm just gonna be like half an hour. Cool. I guess set up some merch here, sort of thing. Hey, let's talk about merch. What do you have available for merch? Because I know that you gave us vinyl, which is super cool, and that was probably the most recent thing in March, right? Yes. So, so talk about that. What do you have for merch? Okay, so I have um, one shirt design, like I. <laughs> Very very small. I have a very small scale. I have uh, the Descendants parody logo that I did for growing up as dumb um, shirts. I have stickers. I have buttons. I have um, five button designs. Um, I have let's see stickers. Yes. Um, and I have uh, three CDs. So I have the full length that I put out, the EP on Dawson Road that I put out in March. Um, I also um, have um, physical copies of um, Justin Acker Ackerman's uh, What Do You Know About Scott Volume 3, which mm -hmm. I'm on. I'm going to be on Volume 4, which comes out next month. I was going to say Volume 4 is coming out. Yes. Um, and I also have um, a limited edition, um, one sided 12 inch final version of Thoughts on the Road. That's cool. Yeah. So, as far as like your merchandise, do you make all of that yourself? Did you draw the imagery, or do you like kind of network and have a friend who I, does that? I mean, basically, like the whole thing with Nate Funk was like, okay, it's like, like I, I treat my shit as like bare, as like not not original. Like everything's a fucking like, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm basically a Jeff, I'm basically a fucking modern music industry Jeff Rose stock rip off dude, I'm fucking on the fucking West Coast. <laughs> 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 um, no, but. Um, yeah, like it, like all my designs are basically just parodies of, of, of shit that's out there. You know, like um, there's obviously the classic Descendants mm -hmm. logo. Um, I did a parody of the Hop Ivy logo. I did it for one of the buttons. Uh, I did a parody of the Joy Skateboards logo. I like that you're saying parody and not copyright infringement. <laughs> just kidding. As a band director, I have to know my copyright law. It's covered you under fair use. Fair use got covered under fair, fair use. use. So. <laughs> so here's the thing. When you release music, because this is a soapbox issue I stand on repeatedly, are you utilizing a distributor to release your stuff digitally? 
digitally. Okay. So for, for me, yes, I, I do rely on that. Um, I go through CD Baby. Um, I go through Bandcamp um, for, for, for shit. I try to direct people to Bandcamp if they want to do that. Um, I release my music on a donation basis, basically. So same same ethos as Jeff Rosen talked. He's huge influence on, on me as a artist and as a musician as well, but like more so as like the approach to being a musician, being approached to, to, to artistry and, and to touring and to music industry. So if people want to listen to your stuff or purchase anything that you have, where can you direct them? So where are you? If you want to support my stuff, if you want to steal my stuff <laughs> digitally, um, for like to, to say to, to listen to offline, um, all my music is available for free download um, on neatfunk.bagcamp.com. Um, uh, I'm also on Spotify, um, Apple, um, Google Play, Apple Music now, so on iTunes apparently. Um, yeah. Basically, I just hit hit all whenever I did the CD Baby shit. I just like I don't give a fuck. I'm just gonna play it. I just want it on, on on these streaming services, um, which means there's a few on YouTube as well. Um, if you want the latest stuff, though, follow my bank account because like I'll pre I'll surprise release shit. Like if I record like a random cover or some shit like that. So if anybody who is watching and paying attention today who wants say merchandise, they want a T-shirt or a sticker or a button. How would they obtain those things? Are you going to take orders on Facebook, Instagram? Oh, you have I a do website? That, I do that on my bank account. Okay. Yeah. So all my merch, um, my merch, my online merch is run through my bank account as well. So if you want to purchase a shirt, if you want to purchase a uh, vinyl, I have a um, handful of copies left. Just go to, go to my bank account. Awesome. Very cool. And how about upcoming shows? You got any upcoming shows besides this one? Um, I actually don't have any upcoming shows for the rest of this year. So. Um, this was your last one. Yes, my too? last show of the year is, is down here. Um, my I, I do have a show coming up uh, in uh, downtown LA, uh, January I believe sixteenth, Thursday. I'm pl actually playing with uh, a local from here, um, Caitlin Edwards, plays for Bugsy New Jersey. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, she's her band's uh, flying out and doing some, some some shows in Southern California. That's and cool. I play with them yeah, there. Awesome. Yeah. As far as upcoming festivals because Caitlin runs Punk and Burbs, um, which happens in September, and we do Milwaukee Punk Fest, which is in August, and there's Punk a hard Picnic. eye roll there. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. There's Sky by Sky West in Texas, and yes. then this year Supernova is back, so are you planning on hitting any of those? Yes, I hit up Supernova. I got denied. Um, I, hit, I put an application for uh, Pitchfork in Boise, we're probably going to not do that because um, we're looking to record in, in March. Right. Um, but uh, we're opening for summer. Um, we're, I've thought about it. I want to try to make it out to the Midwestern summer. I've never been out here, actually, when it's not cold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't guarantee that if you come back in September, now that you've jinxed yourself, yes. if it would be warm, <laughs> um, it would be slightly warmer than now, we could say, maybe. Uh, 20 degrees at least. <laughs> 20 degrees, yes. Yeah, but pay attention. And if Caitlin's coming up by you, ask her, hey, can I get fucking on Punk the Birds? Because uh, that would that would be pretty cool. It's just like an hour jaunt south of here in Lumberg, Illinois. Um, and you're going to go see the Crombies tomorrow. Yep, I'm going to be at the Crombies show tomorrow. I unfortunately couldn't get tickets to uh, um, anti-flag game tomorrow because you know it's sold out. Fuck you, V. Just gotta say that. Fuck you, B. <laughs> <laughs> Love you! But, I mean, I, I'm down for fucking, like, ska, and, like, traditional ska, soul. Like, I love the shit out of, out of like, Slackers, Agrolyze, Singer ATX. Oh! I'm, I'm yes, so we're talking sad. about this! I am so fucking sad that I, I like, I, I, like, I saw that the, I knew that they were doing reunion shows in Portland, I was like, fuck, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to make my way up to there, but like, I ended up having some, some bad shit that I had to, to take care of. I had life happen. Life happened, and oh. I, I miss it, so, uh, can you guys see your ATX, you need to schedule another reunion You show. could just come do a reunion show here, just saying. That, that would be awesome. It would be pretty, pretty stellar. That would be awesome. I love them. I love them. I love them so much. They're like, so good. High five to them! Yes. Ooh, that was a good high five. That was a great high five. Uh, so in closing, because I know we've reached the top of the hour, and I think we've covered everything, upcoming shows, recording, uh, merchandise, where people can find you. Hey, Funk, what do you have to say in closing, my friend? Um, let's see here. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's been a crazy year, you know, just 
the music releases were touring with like life too and like discovering like I, I'm not gonna lie like I had like my second like quarter life crisis like this past year but um, you know it's, it's I've come out stronger and um, <laughs> good <laughs> actually a big proponent um, uh, and big thing that I've thought about over this past year is like you know and I've always tried to think about what am I doing with the music like I don't give a shit about like what the music is I what really matters for me is what am I doing with it um, really inspiring band to the, the, um, that a big band that really inspired me this year was um, Pity Party I played with them in San Luis Obispo at this house show um, they become like basically like one of my favorite bands um, Sarah um, Sarah Levy their their singer and guitarist is uh, like like she's such one of the most inspiring people in, in, in the punk rock scene right now in my opinion because um, that band promotes like so much positivity and so much awareness of like mental health and like just community and, and whatnot I, you know I, I, I took I took one of their zines that they distributed and I, I started carrying them and just just to hand out at, at shows as cool. well and um, it's a self-help it has a list of like um, hotlines and resources for different um, things you can deal with for if you're dealing with um, with mental uh, mental health issues if you're dealing with thoughts of suicide if you're dealing if you're um, LGBTQ um, especially for um, for um, LGBTQ youth, uh, and it's really tough to navigate. I, I, I teach, um, especially as a teacher, I see the difficulties they have, especially um, when there's no support at home for, for, for them. It's, right. it's really, it's it breaks my heart, like, all the time. Um, Love each other. Yes. And, you Fucking know, get over it. So that, and it, it, it's basically, like, like, you know, after playing with 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 pity party and, and her, you know, it's, it's inspired me to like you know just spread this message of like just positivity and community and just you know love each other. Um, and it's even more inspiring too because Sarah's also another educator too. She's also another awesome. um, another teacher. Awesome. Yeah, I, I work in foster care. <laughs> so so uh, this this morning I went to a credible messenger presentation. And what Credible Messenger is, is a program that started in DC, um, and it is run by people who were formerly incarcerated, and their whole goal is to influence youth who, it's in Maryland, and DC it started actually in like juvenile corrections, and it was preparing kids to either return home to community or to face federal time, and what that means as far as survival and the biggest message that they continued to talk about today was don't get comfortable, you know, make your space positive where you are with the best that you have, but you owe retribution back to your community. Yes. Yeah, you fucked up, own that shit, go back to your community and make better. And so these credible messengers um, mentor kids, you know, it is uh, very much a communal supported thing. And a lot of it was, you know, spreading that message to the youth, stay positive. You did fail. That doesn't mean that you're a f constantly a failure. Like this was one period in your, your life that something happened and we can continue to build upon that. And I think that is a very important message that all of us need to be proponents of is that if we want to see better within any fucking community and this, this reaches globally, we have to actually give a fuck about each other and that means saying I don't care about race creed color uh, gender um, so like how you identify etc because the crux of the matter is at the end of the day we all bleed the same we all have the same makeup and those little things that are very arbitrary that have really been um, I would say at the precipice of our legislation that divide us um, are not things that we should allow to divide us any further. I do have to say that within the scene currently, even though I'm not a big fan of call-out culture, that the youth very much want us to know that I don't care if I wear a dress and you shouldn't care either. What am I doing to help our community? Am I feeding you? Do we have a place to live? Do we have education? And can we learn equally? And do we have a place where we feel safe? And those are things that we have to, I think, at some point push past. It's not about the almighty dollar, and it's not about 
you know, ownership of, of property so much as caring about each other. Yes, we, it's, it's, we live in a world where everyone's isolated, everyone's so focused on their image and focus on the ego, and it's, and it's like, no, that's not what it's all about. That it's, it's such a terrible folly of life to be stuck in that, that, that bubble. Like, your bubble, your influence, it goes so far, and you're nothing without it, it, everyone else. Mm -hmm. We also have another initiative, too, in this area specifically, Racine. It's on the back of my phone. They've started to um, hand out, and they want on everybody's IDs, and they, they give out stickers, too. It's on the back of my phone. Um, national hotlines for mental health as well as suicide prevention yes. and so those are important things to never ever 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 feel that you can't talk to somebody because there is somebody who it. gives a fuck somewhere and you yes. can call and you can reach out um, and there should never be anybody who feels alone the credible messenger who did the presentation today said that it's not so much focusing on the punitive and saying that this person did wrong so much as we as a society failed this person. Why did they act this way? And what can we do to make them act differently? And, you know, he, he gave an example of a bed. These kids are getting locked down and put in solitary for 23 hours a day with no food and fucking light because they didn't make a bed. Well, why didn't they make that bed? Maybe they don't know how. Did you show them how to make the fucking bed? Muscle doesn't equal result. Mm -hmm. You have to actually care and teach. So... I will get off of my soapbox <laughs> currently, but yes, I think if we could all cut, I, I see that in our music scene currently, is there is a push to be inclusive yeah. and to have a message that is, you know what, even with, with drug addiction, I don't give a fuck. I, like, I care if you're shooting heroin. I'm going to be honest. I don't want you to do those things because I think that you're better as a human, and I don't like that you don't feel that you're valuable enough to not do that. But that doesn't mean that I wouldn't feed you and give you something warm and make sure that you have resources to come into self-actualization that you don't need that anymore. Yes. So we care. High five. Another high five? High five. Thank you, Nate. This was, this was great. Nate Funk from San Bernardino, California, um, currently on tour, but going back to California after this weekend. And we should anticipate new music with the Maxis in what? Summer-ish, if you're recording in March? I'm not sure about the Maxis, but for sure Nate Funk's going to be in the studio in March. Cool. So so new music on the way. Check out his band camp. You can purchase his merchandise there. He does have really cool vinyls, um, as well as t-shirts and stickers and buttons and those sorts of things. And if you are in the Chicago area, stop out to the Crombie Show tomorrow night and say, fuck you, V. No, just kidding. <laughs> that's, that's sent with love. Uh, we bid you adieu. 2019 is over, my friends. We will be back in 2020. We are currently booking. There are some slots in January and February still available. March is currently all booked. Um, and new this year, too, so that you can pay attention, please. Every quarter, the Knights of the Roundtable and myself are going to do a viewer's choice. So if you hear new bands that are up and coming, you have gone to a show and you're like, I got this thing. Send us your music. We're going to do a viewer's choice so that we can continue to help spread the information that is underground music. Okay, thanks. Bye.